Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Community Conversation here on Facebook Live. I'm Mayor Eric Papenfus, and I'm glad you're able to join us here at noon on Fridays, as uh, we have been doing for the past several months and will continue to do. Today's topic is Juneteenth. Uh, what does it mean historically? What are we doing in Harrisburg? We're also going to talk a little bit about Father's Day, which is also this weekend. And we're joined by uh, three really tremendous guests. I'm very pleased to have them all. Um, we have Mr. Ralph Rodriguez, who's the founder of All You Can Incorporated, to talk about uh, Father's Day Grab and Grow cookout event that is planned for this weekend. We have Michael Simpson, who is the founder and executive director of Capital Rebirth Incorporated, and he's one of the leaders behind the Juneteenth celebration that's going to be going on here uh, very shortly. And we're joined by Mr. Lenwood Sloan in person and in studio uh, to talk about the historical uh, background of Juneteenth as well as the Commonwealth Monument Project. We're going to get an update on that, and uh, we're very, very excited about all those things. I want to start with a, a few general announcements, and then we'll get right into the discussion and conversation. Um, the first announcement is that uh, we lost another great leader of Harrisburg due to COVID-19 very recently, and that's Lisa Berhannon. Uh, it was a, a tremendous loss. She was a true mother in charge and a tireless advocate for, uh, for change at the local level. I had the great pleasure of working with her on a number of initiatives, and she will be missed. Um, the city is hosting a outdoor funeral uh, celebration of her life this weekend, Saturday, at uh, the Banshell in Reservoir Park. The actual service will be at 11 a.m., and before that, there will be a viewing, and I hope people will be able to come out and uh, join that uh, remembrance and celebration, as well as uh, be able to spread out and keep, uh, keep a safe distance from one another in the beautiful Reservoir Park. So that's, uh, that's this Saturday at 11 a.m. Also, uh, while our programming is limited this summer for what we're able to do for our youth from a Parks and Rec standpoint, I am pleased to announce that starting this Monday, June 22nd, we will be offering a free summer lunch program throughout the city in a number of parks and, program, uh, parks and playgrounds. Um, on Mondays and Thursdays, from 10 a.m. until 12.30 p.m., for kids ages 5 to 18, uh, we will have lunches available. We'll actually be giving out three servings on Mondays and two servings on Thursday. And we're doing this at four different locations in Harrisburg. We're doing it at Morrison Park. We're going to do it at Reservoir Park. We're going to do it at 4th and Emerald, and we're going to do it at Cloverly Heights. So this will be a free summer lunch program for, um, for anyone, uh, all children age 5 through 18. Stop by the park, uh, grab and go, uh, have a picnic, and, uh, uh, and that's something that we'll be doing throughout the summer. And uh, we're, we're really pleased to be able to offer that, and we want to thank our partners, including uh, the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank. Also, uh, I would encourage everyone to uh, tune in uh, live on YouTube this Tuesday for, a, uh, for City Council. Uh, we will be introducing two major pieces of legislation that are uh, important reforms. Uh, one has to do with police reporting and making statistics and other information related to use of force uh, public. Um, and that, uh, that bill will be introduced on Tuesday, along with a bill providing for an advisory board for community uh, review and input over the police department. Both of those bills are tremendously important, and we want your, uh, your comments as they uh, go through the legislative process. So um, please join us Tuesday for, the, for those introductions. I also want to state that I've been getting a lot of response to the city's Eight Can't Wait initiative. And uh, I've, uh, uh, the email is still open, which is 8 can't wait, the number 8 can't wait at harrisburgpa.gov. If you want to comment on the city's use of force general order, uh, make suggestions, uh, this, uh, this conversation is ongoing. We had a, a very good uh, show last week. If you didn't get a chance to watch that, you can see it on YouTube. Uh, with uh, members of the community and the police department, and we're getting a lot of good feedback on how we can reform our use of force general order. 
Um, also on Tuesday, as one final announcement, uh, if you were a business or you know a business that was impacted by Governor Wolf's uh, order, um, there's relief coming, uh, I hope, for your, for your trash bill. Um, uh, we, we've seen an up, uptick in, in residential trash in this city as more people were at home, but we've seen a downturn in commercial trash as many businesses were forced to close for a period of time. Uh, we're proposing, and Council will take this up on uh, Tuesday as well, and hopefully approve a credit, a forward-looking credit, of up to two months to businesses that were affected by the stay-at-home order that will be applied um, to, uh, to those businesses' trash bills. So you can find out more about that, and I'll have more about that once it passes, hopefully, and we're able to implement it. Um, but there will be an uh, application period, and we can help spread the word to businesses. And that's uh, yet another thing we're trying to do as businesses get back to business here in the green phase, um, uh, which is uh, where we are now officially here on uh, Friday, Juneteenth for Dauphin County and Harrisburg City. A lot of businesses uh, can use, use support, and I want to encourage people uh, to support our local businesses as best we can and to do so safely by continuing to follow recommended guidelines, wearing a mask, washing hands, uh, practicing social distance. But um, uh, it, it, these are things that we can do while we also return to some level of normalcy moving forward um, as the uh, uh, health crisis begins to uh, decrease, at least in the severity during these summer months. And that's partly why we're doing so many things outside. And um, let's turn now to our first guest, who is Mr. Ralph Rodriguez, founder of All You Can Incorporated. And uh, uh, Ralph, let's let's start with um, the Father's Day grab and go uh, cookout event. Can you can you tell me more uh, about it? Um, uh, when is it? Uh, what's going on? And uh, how can people uh, participate? Yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, first and foremost, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, thank you for having me on. Um, happy Juneteenth to everyone. And uh, definitely want to send a rest in paradise to Miss Lisa. Um, but the Father's Day grab and go was just another initiative we wanted to go ahead and implement for the city a way of uh, us showing appreciation to the dads who sometimes we feel might be overlooked through, of course, the much bigger and greater Mother's Day celebration that usually brings on, you know, ceremonial and traditional um, American traits to the holiday and the day. We, we wanted to uh, go ahead and implement something that we felt um, that goes a long way for dads. You know, there's something amazing that happens when a boy becomes a man and then that man has to look after another um, small child, whether a boy or girl. And just the transition, the metamorphosis, if you will, when a man says, you know, I'll take you under the wing, I'll show you everything I know. And hopefully what we've learned together throughout the way will make you a beautiful, bright human being as you get older. So we wanted to really put a stamp on that, um, just with the motto of doing all we can uh, for the community. Um, what All You Can is, basically, we provide basic needs and emergency resources for at-risk families in the communities. So what greater way, uh, besides your traditional events uh, during the pandemic, to have a grab-and-go style where everyone's safe. So uh, we had families registering for about a month and a half out already um, to the line. And it's not too late, by the way, anyone that's watching. 717-602-6936 is the information line. It just takes a minute to uh, reserve your spot. And as fathers pull up or walk up due to trans, uh, transportation issues, we will have people definitely lined up six feet uh, apart for social distancing. And as cars pull up, we'll have volunteers get their name and we will have definitely a hot uh, to-go meal with clamshells provided plastic bags. Definitely gifts for the dad if any children uh, wanted to stop by with their parents. Definitely brand new un, uh, unopened toys for the children. And of course, a meal for mom. We cannot leave mom out. Uh, but just another way to show solitude and thank you to all the dads that do a lot and go away and sometimes are just overlooked in our community. Oh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, this is uh, really exciting. So this is this Saturday. It is from noon to 3 p.m. And as you just heard, uh, there's still time to reserve your meal. Um, and uh, tell us where it is. Where do people come by to uh, pick it up? I'm sponsor of All You Can. Um, we're utilizing their storefront, 333 Market Street, right downtown in the Harrisburg area. Um, just stop by from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. if you wanted to take part or just have a great conversation with some of us, see what it's all about. We'll be there distributing meals. Of course, masks will be worn. 
gloves. We'd be practicing social distancing. So everyone would remain safe, even though we're in the green, we should still practice precaution uh, so we can remain safe throughout. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I'll be, uh, I'll be stopping by and uh, joining you for a part of that after the uh, funeral services uh, conclude up in Reservoir Park, and I'm really looking forward to it. So tell us a little bit more about uh, All You Can. How long has it been in operation, and uh, what else have you been, been doing? All You Can, um, it, it started as a conglomerate of just kind of buddies looking to do uh, a little bit more in the community. We started uh, in the Joshua group. We were the mentees that became the mentors, and we wanted to kind of sprout out on our own. So about 2012, we started our, our flagship program, which is our Christmas program, and it has grown uh, since then. We Three years later, we started being allotted buildings and um, different facilities to uh, execute our events, and it's really picked up steam. We um, got our 501c3 up here recently, and now we're able to conduct and uh, engage events on a different aspect and really make this our living motto and what we want to do, you know, for its eternity. Um, well, all you can basically does, like I said, the basic needs and emergency resources for families. So a lot of times we'll get calls from different um, resources or state, local entities that may say, hey, Ralph, um, or sometimes uh, contact my secretary or someone from the team. Someone was displaced because of a fire. Uh, is there anything you guys can do? That's a part of our emergency dispatching system. So we'll come out uh, right away, you know, within hours, as long as it's in within the Dauphin County parameters, that's really the concentration. And we're, we're able to provide those basic needs, boots on the ground immediately. So whether that's food, clothing, toiletries, um, you know, just the small things, if there's children, just little incentives to put smiles on their face through those tough times. And uh, we, nine out of 10 times, can engage that immediately. And of course, throughout the years, we have our initiatives, whether that be community events, motivational partnerships with the uh, school district. Um, we just, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been able to not only have our motivational Monday classes in January, but also our day of service that we uh, had with the bridge in February. And we were able to still, we had an Easter plan set up uh, at Club XL, but due to the uncertain times, we even had to switch that. So it was nothing wrong with the aim. We just kind of had to change the target. So we were still able to partner with the school district and distribute about 600 uh, Easter baskets, grab and go style for the children in the district. Uh, so really just helping with that, the uh, Central Pennsylvania Food Bank, the Harrisburg Police Department and school district has done a great job with their grab and go uh, dinner meal boxes, 25 pound box allotments um, for each family that comes through. And that we've able to aid and assist with that. And that's over 10,000 families, a uh, quarter million pounds of food and that's still going as well. So really just, kind of changing the tradition of how we do things, but still being right there in the niche of being able to provide those basic needs and emergency resources. Well, that's well, really that's incredible. Really... Uh, uh, on behalf of the residents of the city, I just want to say thank you. I mean, you are actively out there all the time. Um, we appreciate uh, all of these efforts. If, if there are people watching and uh, they want to get involved and they want to support you and your organization, what's the best way to do that? Um, definitely. I encourage you to log on to www.allyoucanpa.org. Uh, from that website, you can learn a little bit more about us. There is even a contact portion of the website where you can send in your inquiries if you want to volunteer, you want to be a part of it. And then there's also a monetary button if you wanted to donate and help fight the good fight in our local area. Uh, and we made it very simple. You just click and then scan with your phone to take you to either your cash app or PayPal choice, but you know, um, we're never stopping the good fight and it's a continued fight. So we encourage everyone to take the opportunity and uh, chip in where you can. There's great organizations all through the city doing great and amazing things at this time. So like once again, I encourage you to join on, log on or call the information number if you wanna hear more, definitely. Thanks. Thanks so much. And just returning uh, uh, in, in summary here to Father's Day and the and the grab and go plans that we have for for this Saturday, I know one of the um, one of the things which has happened throughout the the COVID nineteen pandemic has been uh, more and more families have uh, through uh, isolation and stay at home had 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 more time to spend together. Um, and uh, and I think uh, if, if there if there's been any uh, silver lining to a, a difficult situation, um, we're we're really being focused more and more on the importance of family and the family unit. Uh, but why is uh, why is Father's Day uh, important to you? Why is it uh, why is it important that we that we uh, celebrate our fathers and uh, put that type of emphasis on on family? Great question, Mr. Mayor. Um, being a father of five. 
all my babies go to the Harrisburg School District. All of my babies were born here in Harrisburg. Um, but universally, I think fathers uh, have a connotation. Well, you know the sayings, uh, mama's baby, father's maybe, our song is Papa was a Rolling Stone. Um, so just kind of, you know, changing that connotation and, and showing that, you know, there are more dads uh, gaining custody of their children due to uncertain, unfortunate circumstances. There are more dads in the community stepping up and exemplifying what a great role model is. So I think it's important to carry that on with our demographic of every inner city um, of black and brown men to, you know, really show that it's a new day, it's a new time, 2020, um, you know, whatever the connotation was in the past, we're going to leave that in the past. And there are great fathers uh, stepping up and they really, you know, deserve the same momentum that Mother's Day, really any holiday, uh, you know, my hat's off, my heart, you know, 100% goes out to every father. Um, and I see you, you know, all you can see is you, the city of Harrisburg sees you uh, for the voiceless dads that sometimes go through it and, and can't visit it, visit their children or, you know, sometimes uh, families that come home from prison and they're trying to re-enter in, in the society and it's hard for them to develop a home plan or a custody plan to see their children. You know, I think it's really important um, that we speak for these voiceless individuals and we create a path where we're all celebrated together, uh, unified and as a family. So, you know, once again, my hat goes out to all the fathers, single dads, you know, um, together fathers, married dads, no matter if you're a dad, my hat and my heart goes out to you. Okay, and one more time with that number, if people want to uh, uh, participate in the grab and go and uh, get themselves a wonderful uh, Father's Day meal, what number do they call? Participate in the Father's Day grab and go initiative, please feel free to call 717-602-6936. Once again, 717-602-6936. Only takes a minute to register. So uh, give a call. You have about till tomorrow, about 10 a.m. Um, to get on list. Uh, even if you wanted to walk up, we, we're not going to turn any way, uh, turn anyone away. But just keep in mind, we will have people at a six foot uh, distance pace. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And again, that's Saturday, June twentieth, from noon to three p.m. at the at the Sneaker Villa on Market Street. And we're going to turn now to uh, Michael Simpson, who's the founder and executive director of Capital Rebirth. And Michael, uh, I know you, uh, you work very closely with Ralph on a number of different initiatives. And just uh, by way of starting, uh, one of the most powerful uh, things that I've seen over the past two weeks was uh, uh, you on one side of Governor Wolf and uh, Ralph on the other side of Governor Wolf marching through uh, uh, Third Street in the neighborhoods of, of, of Harrisburg uh, with the governor holding holding a uh, Black Lives Matter sign, and then um, watching as the very next day, uh, the governor uh, put forth a series of important reforms on the state level. Um, that was extraordinary and uh, something, I think, to be very proud of. So, so congratulations for your work in, 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 in organizing that. And uh, let's, uh, let's talk about what we're doing now for, for Juneteenth. Um, it, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the event that's going to be going on here today? Um, what's going to be offered and uh, how's it going to work? Yeah, so just to touch on what you said, me and Ralph and a couple of other gentlemen um, collided our, our powers together um, and resources to have that for uh, protest. And like I said, I think that was the first time nationwide that we had the uh, state governor, the mayor, which is you, uh, and the chief of police walk in hand with us and sit and listen to us, you know, uh, the whole entire time. Uh, like I said, this is a celebration of Juneteenth, the event today that's taking place. And it's also a celebration of that protest. Uh, like I said, you guys got to work the very next day. Uh, we're paying attention. We're looking. Uh, you guys are working. And that's all we can ask for, you know, is you work, make progress, you know, to some of these solutions, uh, issues that we have. Uh, but with the event today, it's starting at 5 p.m. with a parade, which is going to start at the bridge. Uh, which is formerly known as the Old McDevitt. Uh, the parade is going to take place and head down. And also, there are going to be 300 plus free T-shirts given out um, that recognizes Juneteenth uh, by Jess Franklin. And she'll give those out on site. Um, we'll start the parade, go down Market Street. We'll cross over on 15th and head straight down to Her Street, um, where the cookout area is going to be from 6 to 8 p.m. at Sunshine Park. We'll have uh, over 700 packaged meals, which would include hamburgers and hot dogs and uh, fruits and vegetables. And we'll also have some vegan options there as well. Uh, we also have about 25 plus black vendors set up. Uh, and with the whole COVID situation, uh, temperatures will be checked for all volunteers 
and all vendors. Uh, we will, uh, you know, enforce social distancing with their vendors uh, setups. Um, and everybody that attends must wear a mask. If you don't, uh, I'm sure people will be there selling them where you can purchase on site. If not, you will be asked to leave. We can't take chances, you know, and have a setback. We just went green today. Uh, people's health is very important and we take that serious. Uh, like I said, we just lost a community leader due to this COVID. Uh, so we really want to stress that if you do not have a mask, purchase one on site or you will be asked to leave and temperatures will be checked for every vendor and every volunteer. Um, and then we'll end um, that from seven to 10 at third and a bird, uh, which is 212 Verbeck street. Uh, there'll be about 10 plus uh, black vendors there also. Uh, and then we'll blow up a 19 foot inflatable uh, movie screen and show the movie black Panther. So, you know, this whole entire day is family friendly. It's a celebration, you know, of our culture and want everybody of all races to come out you know, and be, you know, unified with us, you know, and support us. Uh, and this, we're just looking forward to a great day today. Wow, that's, uh, that's really exciting and uh, a lot to unpack there. Um, so uh, it sounds like uh, the event will begin at about, about 5 o'clock. You can go, go up to the old uh, McDevitt. You can uh, get a T-shirt, and then uh, the parade route will basically run from McDevitt to Sunshine Park. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. Yep, and there'll be some exotic cars, uh, some trucks with people in the back. Um, as far as the uh, people who have organized it, uh, there'll be some motorcycle clubs going. And I just want to shout out, you know, Ralph being one of the organizers for this event, um, Carl Singleton being one of uh, the bridge. Uh, I just mentioned Jess Frankie uh, with the T-shirts, Ryan Willington, uh, Miss Raven Rose, and uh, Coach Fallings, Gary Fallings with Be a Man. Um, we all you know, came together, you know, and like I said, if we can show unity that we can come together, you know, for a big event like this, then it sends a message to our whole entire community that if we work together, you know, everything is much better. Uh, all things are improved and not one organization or what one individual has all the answers or has to take the lead or credit for this situation. If you notice on the flyer, nobody's logo was on it. Nobody's name was on it. It's not about credit. It's about celebrating, you know, all together. Yes, it's great to see those partnerships and that collaboration and that uh, teamwork all coming together for, for a celebration. Um, we're we're going to talk to Lenwood a little bit about the, the history of uh, Juneteenth and the, 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 how the news of the Emancipation Proclamation came to here to Harrisburg. Um, but what, is, what does Juneteenth mean to you? Why, why was it important to, uh, to seize this day uh, for, for celebration here locally? Uh, it's been overlooked. Uh, like I said, our, our, our governor just passed it last year as being a holiday. Um, and we're one of the last states, I believe we're somewhere in like the 42nd state to pass it. A lot of states down south have been celebrating it. So we're late to the party. And like I said, this is something that we all should be celebrating, you know, as a culture, the black culture. Uh, and we can't overlook this situation. This is major to us. This is important to us. Uh, so we'll continue to keep this ball rolling. Uh, especially with, you know, support from you guys at the mayor's office, you know, the governor's office, you know, you guys are working your butts off, uh, you know, trying to reform things and, you know, end this police brutality, you know, this injustice. Uh, so, like I said, this is another form of, you know, bringing awareness to those situations. Uh, and it's also celebrating, you know, between the COVID situation, uh, all the protests and, you know, injustice, fight for it. Uh, you know, it's kind of becoming stressful. Um, you know, sometimes it's tra traumatizing, you know, seeing these situations play out. And we just need a break from all that, you know, and actually just celebrate, you know, enjoy each other's company and get back to some type of normalcy. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. I, I also like what you're doing in uh, supporting uh, uh, local vendors and giving them an opportunity to, to participate. Can you talk about some of the vendors that we will uh, experience and get to see here later today? Um, yeah, so uh, there will be, uh, it's a whole list of them, so to go down, but I know there will be black vendors that's going to be selling their clothing, um, their skin products, uh, a lot of them will be selling healthcare products, um, different type of vegans, um, different type of jewelry, uh, so it's just going to be an array of vendors, like I said, we have over 25 plus that will be on site at Sunshine Park, and another 10 that will be uh, at the Lakatuda, uh, which is the third in the bird. Um, like I said, they're all going to be selling their products that they make for themselves. Um, you know, they're all black entrepreneurs, all black individuals, organizations. Um, you know, like I said, that adds to the celebration. 
And, you know, if we have this platform where, you know, all of these entities are coming together, it's a must that, you know, we bring those uh, uh, people into the fold too, so they could showcase, you know, their ability and display their services. So people in the community are aware of what they have to offer. Yeah, that's important, and and I know that those businesses have all uh, all suffered and all all been hurting uh, due to the the health pandemic. And if we can get out and support them, it will it will be meaningful and very important to them. So I'm hoping everyone will come and join and support these vendors. Um, and as you mentioned, it's also third in the Berg, which is a sort of third Friday celebration. So some people will be out for that, walking around. And if they go to La Cultura, which is on Verbeck Street, um, they'll get to uh, experience this uh, lasting into the evening. So what time does uh, Black Panther start and uh, where will the, the screen be set up? Uh, we have a, a permit to block the street off for Verbeck. So right on Verbeck, we're going to blow the screen up. So if you want to bring your lawn chairs, your blankets and whatnot, nice, hopefully nice. this weather holds off. Uh, like I said, it's a 19 foot inflatable uh, Black Panther. You know, he symbolizes us, you know, as, as Black Americans. Uh, and, you know, like I said, this is a great movie. It's a family friendly movie and a family friendly atmosphere. Uh, vendors will be spread out, you know, indoors and outside as well. Uh, you know, so that's just a great way of ending the day. Oh, it sounds, it sounds terrific, and I'm glad we're going to uh, be able to do it outdoors and uh, enjoy it uh, safely, and uh, Verbeck's a great street for that with, uh, with lots of room to spread out. So um, tell us a little bit about Capital Rebirth, and uh, how long have you been around, and uh, what sort of things uh, are, are you focusing on in Harrisburg? Okay, so Capital Rebirth, uh, the name came from Capital, you know, being Harrisburg. Uh, rebirth uh, is kind of like symbolizes my life. Um, for those who don't know, uh, the same day I signed an NFL contract with Cincinnati Bengals, uh, I failed the physical due to uh, them finding spinous venosa and bone spurs on my spine. So I was told I could never play football again. So I went to a very dark, deep place, uh, very suicidal, very depressed. Uh, and the birth of my daughter rebirthed my life. So that's where rebirth comes from. And its meaning stands for respect earned by intelligence, resilience, truth, and humanity. And I think that's the character of a winner. Um, uh, so that's where your name came from. Uh, we've been up and running for about two years now. We just got our nonprofit uh, status last uh, August. Um, our biggest events so far uh, have been our Superhero Anti-Bullying Day, uh, which we hosted on City Island for the past two years, uh, where we have adults come up and dress up in superhero suits, and those attending are encouraged to dress up as well. Uh, we give out free food, um, free drinks. Uh, they're inflatable bouncer houses spread out throughout the field. Uh, free field day games like you see at the school setups. Uh, and our next one probably would be a stop the violence and drug abuse, which we had our first one last year at Reservoir Park, the bombshell. Um, and we had vendors on site as well. Uh, and free food, we have different uh, entertainment um, forms of poetry. We had the Harrisburg Cougar cheerleaders come out. We had different step teams come out from the youth. Um, we had uh, rappers come out, singers come out gospel singers so you know it's just a celebration you know of entertainment uh bringing that fun to it but also bringing the seriousness awareness to you know the gun violence you know and the drug abuse so when we do events we like to have uh vendors on site that offer those type of services in that field so you don't just come to an event and say hey i attended to stop the violence and drug abuse talent but I didn't learn anything or I didn't, you know, walk away with any type of, you know, access to any service. So we try to get those vendors on site so you can get your help and information right there. Um, and I, we like to do uh, alumni sporting events, which consisted of flag football uh, for women and men um, and basketball. And then we had our youth participate during halftime of those games. Uh, we've done uh, free football clinics. Uh, we actually joined for the past two years the uh, city's Thanksgiving Day Parade which was very cool and fun for us. Uh, we had a lot of fun with that. Um, like I said, we just try to make all our events free um, and they're family friendly. Uh, and like I said, we don't, you know, we don't make a penny off of anything we do. All these, uh, you know, events that you see that we have put together have come out of our own pocket. So this isn't, you know, something that we're doing for profit at all. You know, we just feel like we want to be the solution, you know, to a lot of these problems in this community or the scapegoat, you know, for that moment or that day you know, until we continue to build more on what we're trying to do. And that's why, you know, we put a bid into purchase uh, William Penn, which is uh, uptown old uh, high school that's been sitting for about 10 years. So we kind of want to bring all those things that we do and services to that place. 
Well, well th thank you thank for all you that you do. Uh, it's uh, it's inspiring and incredibly important. Um, if people do want to uh, uh, want to support your efforts and reach out, how do they how do they reach you? How can how can they um, join Capital Rebirth? Uh, absolutely, you can join our uh, visit our website, which is www.capitalrebirth.com. Uh, we're on Facebook, Capital Rebirth. Uh, our Instagram page is Capital Rebirth 717. Uh, like I said, you'll see me around in the community a lot, as well as our members. Uh, we like to stay engaged and hands on, you know, so we have a true pulse of what the community needs and wants are. That way we can provide solutions. Thank you. I've seen how many people have signed that uh, William Penn petition online. And uh, I also know uh, uh, there seems to be some debate. Will the Black Panther be making an appearance tonight? He most definitely will. Uh, secret, it, it will be me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, like I said, anything that's needed done for my organization, you know, I do. I'm never, you know, going to be that guy where I feel like, you know, I'm too big or, you know, I'm too removed from anything. Like I said, uh, I'm definitely going to put the suit on today and join the parade. Uh, yeah, so Black Panther will be there. All right. All right. Well, that's something for the, for the whole family to look forward to and enjoy. It's going to be a lot of fun. I look forward to uh, joining the parade, too, and uh, marching with you over to Sunshine Park and uh, uh, checking out all the vendors. It's, uh, it's great. We're going to turn now to... Yeah. No, it says great. I appreciate it that you're joining. Okay. okay, I look forward, I look to, forward it. to it. I'm going to turn now to, uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Lemwood Sloan. Sloan. And uh, Lemwood, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I think it's really important that uh, we have some historical context here. And we talk about uh, the history of not, not only Juneteenth, but also the history of the Emancipation uh, Proclamation and uh, uh, the news coming to, to Harrisburg. I, I want you to know, in your honor, I wore my Emancipation Proclamation tie. I noticed that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, as we know, um, uh, news of the Emancipation Proclamation didn't reach uh, everywhere equally, and in fact, it took some time for that news to make its way uh, uh, to Texas. Um, but can we can we start a little bit about talking about how Harrisburg responded to the Emancipation Proclamation? Can you give us some historical context? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for having me. And uh, I was so stimulated by the two brothers who spoke before, uh, particularly of the notion of celebration because Juneteenth celebration is an act of resistance in itself. The act of celebration is a vigilant, is an act of vigilance and the pursuit of happiness is an extremely important element of the whole fabric that makes America and citizenship. Harrisburg has a particularly conspicuous relationship with the Emancipation Proclamation. While those men and women in Galveston, Texas, were listening to General uh, Gordon and his 2,000 troops, 2,000 troops accompanied him to the reading because the war was still going on there, the strife and the resistance of Texas the Emancipation Proclamation had been passed two and a half years earlier, Mr. Mayor, as you well know, and still Texas resisted. Simultaneously, while Texas resisted, it meant that those who were enslaved in Texas knew. They weren't surprised by the reading of, of the Emancipation Proclamation. They were relieved because they knew that they suffered under a period where in, intellectually they had their freedom, but the whip and the plight and the weight of enslavement was still the reality on the block. This is true today, and this is why people are on the street today, because we have a technical and legitimate freedom, but it has not been fully realized on any block in America. And so still people are waiting to hear the tone of truth in the reading of any Emancipation Proclamation. Here in Harrisburg, we had become involved in the Emancipation Proclamation as early as September of 1862. In September of 1862, Abraham Lincoln asked Governor Curtin to hold a secret meeting. This meeting was called the Governor's Roundtable. It happened in Altoona. Governors from all over 
uh, the mid-Atlantic states, came to Harrisburg and got on a train and went to Altoona, stepped off for only a half a day, crossed the Pennsylvania Railroad Station, and met on the platform to discuss whether they thought Lincoln had enough votes to initiate the legislation in September and October of 62 that would become the emancipation by January 1st. The black community in Harrisburg in general and the men and women of what would become the old Eighth Ward in particular got copies of that Emancipation Proclamation and they read it and they reread it and they gathered in places like Wesley AME Church and Bethel AME Church and the Masonic Lodge, which was then on Tanner's Alley, which is somewhere underneath the Irvis building, what we know now, and they formed a position paper about the Emancipation Proclamation. They were particularly concerned that there was no provision in it for freemen and freedmen. There were no provision for the civil rights of men who were free. They were concerned that there was no provision for what would become of the enslaved after they would be freed and what would be the condition of the transition from their servitude to their rights of equity parity. So what we know as watch night, sir, th that December 31st, everybody romanticizes it, that they were watching and waiting for the Emancipation Proclamation to become law at 1201 on January 1st of 1863. They were watching to hear the resonance of truth and the resonance of protection which they did not hear in the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation. So on January 15th, and this is important and that's why I get so excited, on January 15th, the men and women of the African American community, 1863, met in the Bethel Church, organized in a meeting by Thomas Morris Chester to review the Emancipation Proclamation and to write their response to Abraham Lincoln. They appointed 70 men to go to Washington, D.C. and present their position, including elements of the Emancipation Proclamation that they thought should be written in for civil rights, for franchise rights, for economic uh, parity for safety and justice of a, uh, of a judicial system, for the right to be on, on courts. They failed, Mr. Mayor, not because of their, their action, but because Lincoln did not listen. He could not listen. He was too concerned that their inclusions in the Emancipation Proclamation would mean that he lost this very tentative group of support of governors and legislators. And so those men, they, they on Juneteenth, they listened with a weariness about the Emancipation Proclamation because they knew that there was still a great deal of work to be done. Yes, it was. Uh, uh, I think it's important that we have that context and we recognize the Emancipation Proclamation wasn't the, the end. It was. It was. The, it was the beginning of uh, uh, of a series of changes, which 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 eventually um, lead, however, to the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, so, do you see uh, uh, do you see uh, Chester's role and that uh, that initial dialogue with with Lincoln as sort of setting the foundation for the the rights that eventually become in, uh, instilled in the Reconstruction Amendments? Well, it's very very hard. It's very important for us to remember very important for us to remember that the Emancipation Proclamation did not free one single enslaved person. Lincoln was a lawyer, and so he wrote a document to the succeeded states of the Union. It said unless they return on January 1st, all their enslaved people would be set free by federal regulation. It had no provision for Kentucky or Missouri Maryland. or Maryland, you know, or West Virginia that would come. That didn't leave, Delaware, who did not leave the, the Union. And so the emancipation didn't free. The war freed the enslaved. But the war was a truce, Mr. Mayor. It did not resolve the issue of the freedmen 
in general, and the freedmen of Harrisburg who were asking for civil rights. It, you know, it did, it, the war lifted up the enslaved man, but it left out all of the issues that the freedmen of color in Harrisburg were asking for civil rights, civil justice, and civil liberties. Thomas Morris Chester did see one really important element in that, in the Emancipation Proclamation, and that was the ability for African Americans to enter the war through the United States colored troops. And so he used the, what we now refer to as the Old Eighth War. He used that African American community as a center for all of central Pennsylvania to recruit young men, fathers, sons, brothers, husbands, lovers, nephews, uh, friends in fellowship to join together and come to Harrisburg. And on June 30th of 1863, they met at the Bethel AME Church, which is where the fountain of the Capitol is now. And they marched to the Pennsylvania Station and they set off to Philadelphia. And on July 1 of 1863, they join the United States Colored Troops and the regiments of the troops. They were sent immediately into the most fierce battles. By J July 10th, they were at the Battle of Fort Hudson. They continued to Appomattox. They were left out of the Grand Review of Washington. And then again, Harrisburg came to uh, the call of duty. The men and women of Harrisburg in general and the women of the Henry Highland Garnett Foundation here formed the Grand Review of the United States Colored Troops, and soldiers from 25 states came here in 1865 to march for uh, the black soldiers and their, and their service. One other good piece of history is that the next day, they dissolved their vigilance committees across Pennsylvania and the Harrisburg Vigilance, and they formed the Negro League, whose single purpose was the right to vote. And they worked from 1865 to 1870 to achieve the right to vote, which was the 15th Amendment. Right. Now, uh, you've mentioned the Old Eighth Ward a couple of times. And uh, uh, essentially, for all those watching, that was the, 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 the neighborhood, which, which is, uh, is now mostly the Capitol complex today. Uh, I know uh, that after this, there's going to be a very special, after this taping, there's going to be a very special presentation to the city of Harrisburg. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that is? And um, uh, we're, we're excited uh, to be receiving it. Well, according to history and according to the articles, that on the uh, day that the 15th Amendment was official, that 39 states had ratified it, the people of Harrisburg's African-American communities and what we now call the Old Eighth Ward poured out of their homes in jubilation. And they went to the corner of Tanner's Row, which is 4th and Walnut Street today. Uh, you'll find that, that spot uh, just at across from Temple University in Strawberry Square on the lawn of the Kaylee Roy Irvis building. And they stood in jubilation reading the Emancipation Proclamation and resolving to set work for the right to vote. So we, we have used that moment, which is called a gathering at the crossroads. The crossroads is the crossroads of the Capitol and the city of Harrisburg's downtown business, the crossroads of the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, and the 100th anniversary this year of the 19th Amendment, which extended the franchise to women. The crossroads in time between the legislators who made the law and the people who gathered to force and enforce them, the power of the vote the, is the power of the voice of people pouring out into the street. And so we've created a monument for that corner, which will be unveiled on August 26th in celebration of the power of the single voice to make a change. Four life-size bronze figures will be standing around an orator's pedestal. And these four figures, Thomas Chester, Jacob Compton, 
William Howard Day, and Francis Ellen Watkins Harper all spoke here at a time between 1870 and 1920 for the right of black men to vote and women to achieve the franchise. They're standing around an orator's pedestal because the Lyceum and oratory was the, the way that they changed in those days. And on top of that pedestal is a miniature of what the old Eighth Ward would have looked like in 18, between 1870 and 1912, when unfortunately it was uh, demised, uh, destroyed, uh, torn down through eminent domain to build the park. Mr. Mayor, we cannot restore the old Eighth Ward. We cannot find a rock, a pebble, a portus, a cornerstone, anything that exists in the architecture of the Capitol complex. But we can remember its families that were there because 1,100 families and 500 businesses were there. So we have placed on the side of that pedestal the names of 100 families, African American families, who are exemplars. And we're asking the descendants of those 100 families to come home this fall and stand on that sacred ground and reclaim their legacy and their history in the quest for freedom. The monument the, on top of that pedestal is the miniature of the, of the city then. And you can run your hands down the streets and you can find. Now, the artists were not able to put the entire 500 businesses on that, but they've put it samples on the streets that were then. So you can experience now. We encourage you, in fact, to put your fingers on it. You shine up the bronze and the brass. We're presenting that bronze replica to the city of Harrisburg today as a, a symbol of our thanks for the city, the mayor, the city council, the administration, and the staff continuing to work with us to achieve the placement of the first African-American monument in Harrisburg, in Dauphin County, or, or on the co Commonwealth, and the very, very first monument, sir, on any state capital to the value of the vote. So we will present that bronze piece to the city. Hopefully, it will hang in a prominent spot. We are one of only four cities that still have a Martin Luther King administrated system that our government is embedded in a building that uh, resounds and resonates his dream, and we want the monument and the, uh, to be a GPS marker for artivists, activists, social change agents to, to come and stand on that and be reminded that like the people in Galveston, Texas, we know that the fight is still going on, <laughs> even though we have been legislative that uh, we have that right. We know that vigilance on the street so the monument is a GPS marker in time. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to unpack there. So we're talking about the Commonwealth Monument Project, which, uh, which is going to be uh, located uh, right, right where you described it there, um, across from Strawberry Square in an open um, uh, portion of uh, the Capitol complex. It is, uh, it, it's, it's been a long time coming, it will be the first such monument on Capitol uh, grounds anywhere in the country to African Americans. and. Uh, uh, and, and here we are, uh, uh, over 150 years since uh, since that day, uh, Juneteenth in Galveston, Texas, uh, and we are we are in a position where we're actually uh, erecting uh, monuments to African Americans at the at a, at a time in which um, uh, monuments to others are being sort of pulled down and defaced throughout throughout the country. Um, uh, that's something I think to really celebrate and to to think about. Um, and and uh, what are your thoughts specifically? How does that make you feel that we are we are doing uh, uh, we're, we're we're doing the the right thing here in Harrisburg, while others are reckoning with other types of memorials and things to frankly the wrong thing. You know the American poet and writer Edward Albee has a quote that says, "Sometimes you have to go a long distance out of your way." to come back a short distance correctly. So the monument was supposed to happen a couple of times. You know, uh, we uh, had a couple of stumbles on the field. We had a number of uh, financial setbacks. And by the way, we are still in the campaign to close uh, a debt of about $60,000 to achieve the, the f full uh, vision 
of the architectural space there. But we are going to dedicate on August uh, 26 the Irvis Equality Circle as a place on the South Lawn of the Capitol. K. Leroy Irvis was the first African American Speaker of the House of any state in the Union since Reconstruction. And Mr. Mayor, there is nothing there that says that for him. And so the Equality Circle will be placed there. You and I are historians, so we have to remember that he was the first since Reconstruction, but it was also Pennsylvania's representative to Washington, who was Speaker of the House in 1876, Samuel Randall, who cast the deciding vote to elect Rutherford B. Hayes president and to end Reconstruction. So the placement of the Equality Circle is an act of reparation on that corner. The city of Harrisburg has placed a marker across the street from the site that confirms that Tanner's Alley was an authentic and vetted site of the Underground Railroad. It was the entry into a safe town, a safe place. So the Monument Circle becomes the safety spot on which we can, can stand there. When we place the figures and the pedestal there, Pennsylvania will be building a monument to the achievement of the continuous vigilance for civil rights at a time where cities and states and communities are struggling with people tearing down monuments that are offensive to American history and perpetuate the very reason why there was an Emancipation Proclamation. So we are building up while folks are tearing down. That's right. And this, this is a historic achievement that everyone in the city, in the county, in the Commonwealth should be proud of at a time of so much divisiveness. It also shows how public art, Mr. Mayor, can uh, instigate civic dialogue and how visual arts and public installation can create and animate democracy. Absolutely. It's so important to have that dialogue now. And uh, I think the whole monument project has taken on uh, new resonance and uh, new, new importance in light of um, uh, all of uh, the national dialogue that's occurring uh, right now. Uh, we are, we're honored to receive uh, the gift uh, this afternoon of the, uh, of the plaque of the, of the Old Eighth Ward. And uh, we're also honored as city to be helping uh, fund this monument project. If, uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, may I say very quickly sure. that a limited series of five bronze replicas of the, uh, of the Old Eighth Ward have been created as lasting art pieces of that community. Again, we can't bring the community back, but we can bring its memory back. The first went to the funder, Ms. Peggy Grove, for the series. The second went to the governor. This third one will be presented to the city of uh, Harrisburg, the fourth to the county, and the fifth is being held for some great angel uh -huh. that comes forward to help us over the line. <laughs> well, that's great, and, uh, and, and we'll get there. We'll get there by working together, and it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to see how much progress we've, we've made so far. Um, and I think this monument will stand uh, as a uh, as a uh, an, an important uh, uh, point of, of civic dialogue and civic discussion moving forward, uh, a source of pride, uh, a reminder of our history, um, our rich history, uh, all of which you've uh, done a terrific job of helping describe here today. I, I will say I, one of the really interesting things about uh, the project is uh, all the materials and research that's available currently online. You say we can't bring back the old Eighth Ward, but it's really amazing to go online and to run your cursor over the, uh, the old um, uh, maps and, uh, and, and current uh, uh, satellite views. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about we, some of We've the been blessed, and uh, we have been blessed with the support of Messiah College and Harrisburg University. Our question was, where did the families of the Old Eighth Ward go? And where are their descendants now? And do they knew, know this story about their grandeur? So Messiah College 
Harrisburg University, and a group of scholars and historians whom we refer to as the history detectives, joined together to search for the descendants of the Old Eighth War, particularly the descendants of the Hundred Families. I'm happy to say at the time that we make this presentation to you that we have found descendants of 87 of the Hundred Families whose names are honored on the side of the monument. And we're calling them home this summer. You, you announced on February 18th, right before we went into a pandemic, that summer and fall was Harrisburg homecoming. We're encouraging those families. But they can go on, or you can go on, your listeners can go on to digitalharrisburg.com. They can run their, their cursor over the map, and the names will pop up, and they can find the bios and the histories of those hundred names. Let me say very quickly, Mr. Mayor, that on 3rd and Walnut Street, just a block and a half from the gateway of Tanner's Alley was the Federal Bounty Office. At the Federal Bounty Office sent men into the old Eighth Ward to try to discover the freedom seekers who were being hidden in the safe houses there. Imagine that trauma two blocks away. And still, they continued this advocacy of the Underground Railroad. So we've done a reverse thing where they put up all those wanted signs for men's. We have put up wanted signs all over Harrisburg. You will see them on cat buses. You'll see them in Lamar bus shelters saying, wanted the descendants of a uh, Amos, wanted the descendants of Hannah Jones, wanted. And those want ads are linked to the digital Harrisburg site where families have come forward and put their histories up. There's a, a dynamic body of, of um, information there, and I encourage people to go to digitalharrisburg.com, click on to the old Eighth Ward site, and see the images, the identifications, and the testimonies of people all over the country whom we found as descendants of the old Eighth Ward. Yeah, I encourage everyone to check out the website as well. And uh, Moman, I'm sure we have some questions. Uh, uh, what, uh, what, are, what are the viewers saying today? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I think we have time for one or two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first question goes to uh, Michael. Uh, we have someone that was uh, curious about the route of the celebration um, and how that uh, route was uh, decided on. So it was a, it was a group vote. Um, we had several different options on the table, and we all agreed that this one would be the best one. Like I said, with the bridge being a key component, um, you know, as part of this, orchestrating this event will start at their their land um, like I said Market Street you know it's a very high traffic area uh, a lot of residents um, want to be out you know so if they're not even aware of what's going on you know they can see uh, you know as we're passing by and join hopefully or you know meet us down Sunshine Park or meet us at third and a bird uh, like I said we'll cut straight across on 15th uh, and go straight down to her street that was the easiest route for us uh, you know instead of doing a lot of zigzagging and through uh, the city, you know, blocking a lot of streets off, uh, you know, we just try to make it as short as we can uh, and direct to the point, which is Sunshine Park. And that's great. And we're going to go through the neighborhoods of Allison Hill. We're going to go by the Harrisburg Cemetery. We're going to go down to one of our uh, great parks. And uh, I think it's an opportunity for uh, a parade route, which is a little different from some of the uh, routes that we've been taking recently with, with other marches and celebrations. All right, next question is from Nicole uh, regarding the eight can't wait. Okay. Uh, Mayor, you mentioned uh, earlier about the email. That's how the public can participate. Is yes. there anything else that the public can do to help with this initiative? Well, uh, get the word out and uh, encourage, encourage folks to send uh, their comments. Uh, I've uh, been discussing it on Facebook Live. We've been discussing it uh, in uh, open session with city council. And uh, there's, uh, there's been discussions on social media and elsewhere. I would uh, encourage them to go to our website and print out uh, a copy of the city's general order regarding uh, use of force. It is, uh, as I've, I've said before, uh, a relatively progressive document. It is uh, much better than uh, what you see in some of the larger, country, uh, larger uh, cities in this country. Um, but it still has room for uh, improvement and change. And uh, I want to hear from the public. And part of uh, any change 
uh, any you know any change being lasting is is the communication and the conversation that happens to involve people in that change. So I want people to have a stake in what we're doing, and so um, please continue to participate. All right. And uh, that's all the time for questions that we have, but we do have a short video about the upcoming monument dedication, if we can play that. Fantastic. All right. Uh, and that's going to be, here we go. A gathering at the crossroads commemorates the old 8th Ward, the area demolished in the early 1900s for the extension of the Capitol grounds. The expansion project initiated a transformative period of time in Harrisburg's history, while also displacing thousands of residents in the process. Search for connections and share your story at digitalharrisburg.com. Learn about the Commonwealth Monument Project at monumentpaus.com. Join the Jubilee as descendants of the Old Eighth Ward honor their memory and see history come alive at the dedication ceremony. Witness the unveiling of the first African-American monument on the Capitol grounds. Be a part of this timeless moment and celebrate as a community, Harrisburg's past, present, and future. The Commonwealth Monument Project is an initiative of the IIIPT Harrisburg Peace Promenade, a project of the Foundation for Enhancing Communities, TFEC, fiscal sponsor. August 26th uh, is, uh, is the next uh, an important date on the calendar. And uh, for all those that are watching, digitalharrisburg.com. And then one more note, a reminder to our viewers that the 2 o'clock uh, p.m. event will be streamed live as well for people yes. to join in. Yes. Uh, if you're watching live and you want to come down and join us at City Hall at 2 p.m., uh, please do. But uh, if you're enjoying uh, watching from home, you can also continue to see that event stream live here very shortly. And, uh, and then I hope uh, to see everyone tonight at uh, 5 o'clock uh, for, the, for the, par the parade, starting at the old Bishop McDevitt. And again tomorrow for the grab and go lunch at noon, following the funeral services for Lisa Berhannon earlier in the band shell at Reservoir Park. So it's an action-packed weekend with, uh, with a lot going on. Um, I want to thank all my guests. This was a great, uh, great conversation. Appreciate uh, everyone's time. Lemon, do you have a final my, thought? Yes, one final thought, sir. Uh, we regret the loss of this queen, and we will uh, exalt her tomorrow. But I encourage those who were around her to capture her history before it is dissipated. Her artifacts, her photographs, her letters constitute a body, not only of a single life, but of a movement in Harrisburg, and it is important that those who are close to her and can find evidence of her artifacts capture them, codify them, and present them in a time capsule to the state archives so her memory is not lost, and neither are her, the artifacts of her contribution. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful sentiment, uh, Lemwood, and I, I agree. And actually, uh, very particularly fitting, fitting as they begin to um, uh, pour the foundation for that new State Archives building that's going to be on 6th Street in Harrisburg. Um, and uh, by design, is going to have uh, a, a reading room and, and a whole collection devoted to Harrisburg history. So let's, um, let's not forget the current history of those uh, in Harrisburg that are uh, making a difference every day. And let's, uh, let's memorialize that. I think that would be a fitting tribute to uh, Lisa Berhannon and her life. So uh, again, thank you to all of our guests for a great conversation today. Uh, thank you uh, for everyone at home watching. Uh, this has been another community conversation here on Facebook Live, and we'll see you again next week and every week, Fridays at noon, for further conversation and discussion. Have a great day, and stick around if you can to see the live stream of the Old Eighth Ward plaque dedication and um, uh, transfer to the city of Harrisburg today at 2 p.m.